Okay, um, now, how is this? Can you hear me? Yeah. Pretty good? Probably because I'm old and going deaf that I sometimes pay a lot more attention now to, uh, to making sure everybody can hear. Um, it's, it's great to be here, and uh, what I want to do is, uh, you know, just go through some of the results that, uh, that we have with the Hereford Association project. But I'd also like to go through uh, a little bit of background on residual feed intake and what we know about it. Because we've been working on residual feed intake for, oh, uh, here, in, here in Alberta, probably 15 years. So there's a lot we know about it. We know everything from uh, meat quality to carcass quality to reproductive fitness, uh, etc. So. So this is, uh, you know, something that, uh, that, that, that we should deal with. There's, uh, I think this has been done before, there's a lot of people that have been involved in this project and some of them are here and if I missed any, please, I apologize in advance. And of course, there's uh, quite a few uh, organizations and funders that were involved. Just like uh, John, it'll take me a while to get coordinated with both uh, kinds of things doing at the same time. So traditionally, you know, we have selected or tried to select for feed efficiency for a long time, forever almost, it seems like even, you know, 60 years ago we were talking about, uh, you know, the industry was talking about feed efficiency and primarily uh, the, the trait that we have used uh, is feed to gain ratio. There are other measures of efficiency everywhere from the collaborator ratio to um, you know, relative growth rate, etc. But the one that the industry for years and years has been sort of agreed upon is feed to gain ratio. So the amount of feed an animal consumes uh, versus the amount of gain it has. And, and the difficulty when we start selecting using, genetically selecting using that trait, is it has some rather um, um, undesirable uh, consequences. Feed to gain ratio is related to body size and growth rate, as you can imagine. And what happens when we do long-term selection for feed-to-gain ratio is that we end up with animals that grow faster and eat more. That's, that's what happens, right? 40 years of selection has shown us that that's really what goes. So really, we don't end up with an animal that's any more efficient. Uh, we just end, end up with bigger uh, and uh, bigger animals, bigger cows, and they just eat more. So what we've done is, is over the years we've looked at other traits, and this is probably what we call residual feed intake or net feed feed efficiency, is the trait that most scientists and most people around the world that that, that are working in this area think is probably one of the better ways to express feed efficiency. And really, I'm going to explain it. William did one way, but I'm going to do it in a, maybe a little bit different. And really what it is, is if I measure feed intake, residual feed intake is feed intake that has been adjusted for your size, your body weight, your size, and your level of production or your growth rate. Right? So essentially what it is, is it's comparing animals that are of equal weight and equal grow, uh, growth rate at comparing their intakes, right? So that's, that's what we're trying to do. So essentially we just adjust feed intake for body size, uh, growth rate. And in the case here at, at, uh, at Olds College with the Hereford and at, at Catalan, we also adjust for body composition because that's another uh, confounding factor that could get in there. So that's, that's what we do. Now, when, when we deal with any kind of new trait like this, there's some basic four things that we have to know about the trait. It has to follow these four things that, that are up here. And that is that the trait has to be heritable. Right? If it's not heritable, or at least moderately heritable, then we're gonna have a hard time with it. We've gotta be able to measure it, and it's gotta be repeatable. Right? So in other words, there was a question here just a little bit while ago. What about gen genetic by environment interaction? What about different diets? What about animals that are selected under a feedlot diet or a heavy grain diet versus those that are selected under, under uh, you know, a more forage-based diet? So that's what we would call repeatability. 
And then the other things that, of course, it's important, it's a trait has to be of economic importance. And there, need, there should be few, if any, negative genetic consequences. So if we start selecting for feed efficiency and ending up with really poor fertility, that is not a good trait. And so what I want to do through, you know, over the next little bit is go through some of the information that we have in terms of, um, of genetic correlations. I think I can actually move. Um, so, um, so here we go. So here we started the, the Herford project and uh, the Ensor Herford project. We had some objectives, right? And they've been named for, uh, Tanya said them right off the bat, but I'm just going to remind you again. And essentially what we're doing is we're going to characterize 900 bulls, over 900 Herford bulls for feed efficiency, not just residual feed intake, but we're going to look at other traits as well. That are, that, are, that are really interested. We're gonna do both. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna calculate estimated breeding values and a probably genomically enhanced breeding values. And then uh, we're also going to use the 50K data, the genotyping data, to help with uh, validation of some of the prediction equations for the Hereford Association. And really the bottom line there is the deliverable. And the deliverable is we're looking for efficient bulls. Right? That's what we're trying to do. The bottom line here, we want to look out on this crowd and I want to say you have five efficient bulls and you have, and they are worth more money. And that's, that's really what we're trying to do here. So we put them through a grow, grow safe test. We put them through a feed intake test. And it's wonderful to have our own homegrown technology that's now world famous. Um, uh, the grow safe system and essentially there's there's grow safe systems all over the world right at the bottom now you can see that their capacity when i wrote the, when i put this a few years ago was uh 68 000 capacity but i'm sure that's well over 100 000 now and growing uh, leaps and bounds i actually when i looked at that growth rate way back when i started the total world capacity for grow safe was 500 animals let's say way back in maybe 2002. Over the last while, 12, 15 years, that has grown exponentially. So that's a huge success, a success story for this, uh, for GrowSafe and, uh, and its technologies. So here we do, we do a GrowSafe test. And what we try to do within the GrowSafe test is we try to bring animals, similar animals, similar weights, similar ages, into a centralized test and subject them to um, you know, the, the feeding facility we have here. And in doing so, we're testing animals with the same, under the same sort of conditions. We have the same sex or gender. Uh, they're exposed to the same season, temperature, physiological status. They're on the same diet. And if you look at NRC or the nutrient requirements of beef cattle, you'll see that all of these are the main factors affecting the feed intake of a beef cow or a beef animal. And really, the only two things that are left to measure is feed, or the three things, is feed intake, how much each animal eats every day, its body size and its production. And in a growing animal, production is its growth rate. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some of the results, and maybe some of you have seen this from last year, and I presented this at the uh, World Hereford Congress um, uh, in, in Brandon, or maybe it was Canadian Hereford. Preferred uh, AGM uh, in Brandon. But here are the 2012 13 uh, Hereford bulls for residual feed intake. And uh, what you'll see here, of course, is there's 320 bulls that we had tested in 2012 and 13. And here is their residual feed intake adjusted for fat in pounds of dry matter per day. Right? So as you remember, the average animal would be zero. That would be the average animal. And an efficient animal would be a negative value and a inefficient animal or bull here would be plus. So these, the average of this group here, the average of this overall group of course is zero. Their average daily gain is about three pounds a day and they're eating about 18 pounds of, of dry matter a day. The efficient group here, there's 100, uh, 106 bulls. Their RFI is sort of negative 1.4, and 
and you notice their growth rate is very close to the average as a group. So it's not like this group of efficient bulls is fast growers or slow growers. They're just they, they're just like average. Here's the group that's in the middle. 107 of them. Of course, their RFI is near zero, and they also are at about three pounds a day. And then we have our group of inefficient bulls. Same thing, except that they're eating way more for the same amount of growth. I got a little slide over there, a little little uh, insert over the side. If I took these bulls right here and I produced progeny with them and compared them to the average of these bulls and these bulls, this is what the feed savings would be on the feeder cattle progeny over 100 day, 150 days in Williams feedlot. Okay? So, if we did that, we got the progeny, we took them all and we put them in the feedlot, our efficient sires, their progeny would have reduced feeding costs by about $7 a head compared to average. Remember, this is one generation. This is just one generation. Two generations is double this. So then, if we do that and we compare it to the inefficient ones, it's about $13. So there is this trait, it has economic significance. Here's another way of expressing the same data. And this is important to know about residual feed intake. It's important to know the characteristics of this trait. Again, we have residual feed intake at the bottom, efficient, inefficient, and I put average daily gain at the side. Now you notice one thing right off the bat. There's no relationship between residual feed intake and growth. Do you see that? That's right, right? I mean, that's by definition because we made it that way. So you can see we've got efficient bulls that are slow growers and efficient bulls that are fast growers, etc. And the same thing happens on the other side. And, and that's a really interesting trait. So if I just brought in a bunch of efficient bulls and put them in this room over in this corner and I just picked them out randomly, there would be big ones and there would be little ones. It would be a, it would be a real mix, right? So really what we're looking for is we are looking for these characters right up here in this area here. We're looking for bulls that grow fast and eat less feed. That's what we're looking for. And actually one of the traits that we will be studying or we will be bringing to the Herford Association is a trait called residual intake and gain. And that is a superior growing bull that is superior in terms of metabolic efficiency or uh, in terms of feed intake. And here's just the beans, just so you see them there. Here you can see that uh, that's the average daily gain. You know, it's 3.4 uh, pounds a day. That's pretty good, right, relative to the average as, as all those bulls there. And see these bulls down here, they're efficient, but, but their growth is not, is not very good, right? Two and a half pounds as an average. Now what I did with, I didn't do it with the Hereford Association animals, but I did it with about 2,000 feeder cattle that we had run through uh, various feedlots and, and uh, Stuart Thiessen, by the way, at Namaka Farms has about uh, 58 gross safe nodes, maybe more now, but I think 58. And we've run about um, 2,000, 2,200 feeder cattle uh, heifers and steers through his feedlot measuring individual animal feed intake every day. And I want to show you the economic difference in those feeder cattle in those four quadrants. Remember the four quadrants I showed you with your Hereford bulls? I want to show you with feeder cattle. And here they are here. Same four quadrants. Uh, same kind of data. There's 2,000 feeder heifers and steers. Again, there's absolutely no relationship between feed efficiency here and growth. It's just, it's just not, it doesn't exist. It's just like somebody took a shotgun and took a blast at this screen and that's how the, the coverage was. Here what I did was um, I put in some, some prices into this model where we've got um, the same feeder price for all of these different groups, transportation, uh, vet medicine, interest, yardage, etc., etc. And the main difference has to do with the amount of feed that they consume and how fast they grow, because that's really the major difference here. 
This group here I'm gonna call um, sort of my baseline. And I'm gonna set their price at zero dollars a head, their net return at zero dollars a head. This group right here made $44 more per head in the feedlot, and this group over here. This group down here lost $170. And this group down here, these are inefficient pork growing animals. They lost $200 a head. That gives you some idea of the amount of dollars that you're dealing with. If you can find bulls that are up in this area, that give you progeny up in this area, even over here, then that has a huge, will have a huge impact on the profitability of those animals. Now, one of the things I want to stress at this point is that we're not single trait selecting. And I know that several of you throughout the day have said that we're not single trait selection selecting. So it's important to have a goal, a breeding goal. And I just have given a couple here. Is that a maternal breeding goal, in other words, picking dams, might be this. Consistently wean heavy calves over a sustained lifetime while controlling feed costs. I wean a calf every year, and my cow doesn't eat me out of house and home. That's really what I'm trying to say here. Versus what we would call a feedlot profitability index, where uh, we we're trying to increase the profitability of that animal in the feedlot. So those are different kinds of, of, of indexes we could use. Here's the maternal profitability index, where I'm placing 25% of my emphasis on birth weight and, uh, and calving ease, about 40% on weaning weight, I've got some um, emphasis on uh, feed efficiency, and I'm trying to control cow weight. I'm trying to keep it down. So those are just some of the ways in which indexes can be used, right? And that's really what we're trying to do, right? I mean, you just don't go out with single trait selection. Now, I know many of you have a lot of experience in selecting animals, and you often do some of this in your head. You'll see a bull. You'll like its confirmation you will know its history. You will know where it's from. You know the breeder. You know they're reputable. You know what their conditions are. And then what you'll do is you'll say, growth, I want to have good growth estimate breeding value. I want to have a good feed efficiency. So you can off often do some of this in your head, but it's pretty complicated. You've got to have a lot of experience to do that. Uh, and this is a more pneumatic, a numeric way of doing it. So I'm not going to say everybody has to go out and get a multi trait selection index. I'm not going to do that because the commercial guys will laugh me out of the room. That's just not how it, how it works. But this is just the idea of what we're trying to do here. Now, a question was over here on repeatability, because that's what you're talking about. Genotype by environment or interaction. You're talking about repeatability. If I do. If I measure a trait in a, in a high grain a diet, does it actually repeat itself if I get the same thing with those same animals in a um, forage diet or in a hot environment versus a cold environment? This is what we know about the repeatability of this feed efficiency trait. It's what we call moderately repeatable. No trait is 100% repeatable. Not even average daily gain. So average daily gain has repeatability about like this. That's called moderate, okay? So there will be some animals that will re-rank even in average daily gain, or in feed intake, or whatever trait you pick. So this is pretty good. So this is animals that are tested for RFI on a 75% barley silage-based diet versus a 75% grain-based diet. Growing diet versus a finishing diet. We've also done uh, where we measured residual feed intake in heifers and then looked at them again as first, second, third parity. We get some repeatability there. Not as good as that, though. Um, and really, I think from all of the work on repeatability, we, as we can say, that there is a relationship. If I, if I grow or if I select an animal based on a forage-based diet, there will be a relationship to how that animal or how its progeny perform on a finishing diet. But better yet, if you are trying to pick animals for your maternal cow herd, it would be best to pick bulls 
that aren't growing or are tested on a high grain diet, right? It would be best if they were tested on a more uh, high forage based diet. So that's primarily what, what we would say uh, from, from all of this information. Here's another example about repeatability. This is going on at the Lacombe Research Station right now. We spent years and years and years measuring many, many, many replacement heifers. And so we this is just a small snapshot of the data. Uh, here we measure some replacement heifers when they're 8 to 12 months of age. Okay? So we measure them just like we measure your bulls. Your bulls are being measured here. Then what happens is we wait <laughs> four years, five years, six years, and we bring them back as cows. We say, okay. Have you maintained your feed efficiency, or has it been lost? And so we bring back those same heifers, the four to seven year olds, and essentially this is the average residual feed intake for those cows. Essentially that those things reflect one another. And so really what it says is we have a pretty good chance if we measure replacement heifers for this feed efficiency trait, that cows will come back and will be feed efficient throughout their life. And so that's what this says. In terms of feed savings, these heifers, if we if we assume these these things, there's a you know there's a difference between those those two groups there between high and low or efficient and inefficient. It's about uh, 0.7 or three quarters of a kilogram of dry matter per day at 15 cents uh, per kilogram of dry matter. That's worth about $40 in feed savings for that feed efficient cow. And what I want to warn you about is this, this would be equivalent to about 10 years of selection for that trait. It just doesn't happen overnight. You know, it never, you, the extremes never happen over, overnight. They take some, some time. But this is sort of like the end game of, you know, 40 plus dollars per heifer per year or $46 per cow per year. And you'll see later on that that tends to make sense because of some of the other information that I'll, I'll share with you. The other thing that we want to know is, okay, I have a bull in the feedlot here in a grossing test and I have a heifers that I'm going to be testing under the same conditions. Are those any good grazers? What are they going to do? Are they going to go out and lay on the, over, in the, over in the side there and they're not going to graze and they're not going to do anything during the summer? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to answer the question of repeatability of residual feed intake under grazing conditions. Of intake, individual animal intake on pasture is a bugger. It's hard to do. But we've developed a technique uh, so what we've got here is we've got this group of heifers here, really lush pastures. This is a meadow grown pasture, uh, monoculture. That's all that's there. And uh, the, all these heifers were, and for your information, it, the brown ones aren't the inefficient ones and the black ones the efficient ones. So, so really it's just a mix, okay? These are just for eggs. So to do a feed intake and pasture, we gotta do, we got to use some tricks. And essentially what we do is we dose the heifers, we give them a dose of, of, a, of a pellet, of, a, of an inorganic marker. And those inorganic markers are called alkanes. Passes through the di digestive system without being digested and out the manure. And how it gets diluted as it passes through the digestive tract is an indication of how much feed it consumed. The inorganic marker, or the alkane, is a naturally occurring wax that appears on the outside of plants. It's the waxy material that protects the plants. And so, here is a profile. So anyway, all this is, and we put that inorganic marker into a feed pellet. That's all we did, just like a regular feed pellet. We stuck it in there, all uniformly distributed, and we fed it to the cat, as you can see here. So every day, for about 15 days, we'd bring them in, just in the morning, in the afternoon, and we'd put them in these little pans and give them a little bucket like this, and we'd give them their little half kilogram of, uh, of feed pellets with this indigestible marker in it, and they'd gobble it up, and back they'd go grazing. Okay? We'd do that twice a day for 15 days. So then here is their intake of marker, of actually the pellet, okay? 
about 94 grams in our kilograms, uh, grams, um, actually 940 uh, grams of, of uh, mark or, or pellet is what they could, the maximum they could consume. You can see that both efficient and inefficient animals consumed about the same. And over here on this side, what this is, is it's the profile of, it's the, what we call the alkane profile of what they were grazing, okay? So in the pasture, in that metabrome pasture, there's also alkanes in there because they're naturally occurring. And so what you can see here is each of these are what we call long chain carbons, waxy materials in the plant. Okay, they go from C32 or C24 to C36. And here is the amount that's in there. There's one really important thing to notice is I've got it circled here. So our, our uh, metabrome pasture is in blue and there's the profile. And our pellet is in red. And there is one very strict difference. And of course we did this on purpose. Is that C32 is in our pellet, right here, it's in our pellet, but does not occur in the grass. And so we use that to actually determine the individual animal intake of those heifers while grazing. It works pretty good. And so then here's our result, just to cut her short here. Here on day eight of that trial, we started taking fecal samples every day. So we do grab samples of the fecal material and we have those analyzed for alkenes. And that gives us our intake. So here we can see is our inefficient animals, our heifers, are in red. And our efficient heifers are here. So during the next five days, our efficient heifers had lower intake on pasture than our inefficient. So it's just like we saw, we would see in the, in the feedlot over there. So overall, our efficient heifers consumed about 8.2% less uh, forage dry matter. The interesting thing about that is while they grew, while they consumed less, they gained more. Here's our total gain over the, about uh, the next 46 days. They gained 45 uh, kilograms and these other gained 32. So really interesting. The whole thing about how this worked on pasture was pretty good, right? Essentially what we did is we measured these animals within the feedlot, we put them on pasture, and essentially the trait held up very nicely. So pretty good repeatability uh, in this case. So I'm going to sort of briefly go over some other traits. Um, and really all you need to know is the measure of relationship between two traits is called a correlation coefficient. If the co co correlation coefficient is one, it means there is absolute relationship. If you jump, she jumps, <laughs> okay? That, that's what it means, there's absolute relationship. If the correlation is zero, means there's nothing. Remember that graph that I showed you between average daily gain and residual feed intake, like a shotgun? That had a relationship of zero. So what, right down here we have the, co the, the correlation coefficients between RFI, dry matter intake, feed conversion ratio, uh, linear, all sorts of linear traits like hip height, etc. So there's a positive relationship between um, residual feed intake and dry matter intake like we would think, so that's a good thing. Same thing with feed conversion, in other words, if I improve residual feed intake, I will improve uh, feed gain ratio. Um, I'll show you this one, docility. We do not seem to see much relationship between residual feed intake and temperament, though uh, I'm not uh, completely buying that one because we, you know, uh, anecdotally we, we do see. Uh, there is a good relationship uh, between uh, low RFI and low methane emissions, so that's really good when it comes down to uh, carbon credits. Um, so I'll, I'll just skip some of these and go on to, to these right here. Uh, no effect on RFI has no effect on cow productivity. Little or no effect on uh, heifer fertility or bull fertility. Uh, not much effect on carcass traits, though low RFI or efficient animals are often associated with slightly leaner or a little less back fat, okay? But hardly noticeable by the grader. 
but in all of our studies, we see a really small effect on a little bit less back fat. No effect on meat quality traits. We've studied every bloody meat quality trait you can imagine, everywhere from tenderness to its taste, and uh, we found no, no influence on, on meat quality traits. And this is water breast, so sheer force or tenderness, and there's no or little effect, right? Those, those correlation coefficients are very large. So it looks like that, sort of like that third rule that I covered, I said, should have very few antagonistic effects um, it, it is, it is, is held up. Okay, I'm almost done. I just have a couple more to do, and I want to show some of the things that John Crowley had, had mentioned to you that's going on. This is the Genome Canada database. It's a really large database. There's around eight, almost 9,000 animals on this slide. Here we've got residual feed intake from efficient to inefficient, and these are different populations that these animals came from. So we've got some Kinsella Angus Charlet, these are purebred. We've got some Kinsella hybrids, crossbreds. You know, the old herds that Roy Berg was using way, way back uh, when he was doing his crossbreeding work. We've got this large database called the Alberta Crossbreds that includes the Comb Research Station, the Make of Farms, Desert Ranches, Beef Booster, and by the way, the Hereford Association. So the Hereford data is in here. And then this is the Allura Research Ranch in Ontario. So here we've got a whole pile of information. 9,000 animals with residual feed intake. By the way, 9,000 animals with genotypes, 50K genotypes and higher. And so what we can do with this, and I'll just show you as an example, what we did is we used that part of that database as a training database to give our prediction equations. And then we said, give us estimated breeding values for 20 young bulls and 20 young females. Just like John Crowley had said, at birth, we could determine the genomically enhanced breeding value. And so that's what we did. So we've got, uh, these are all bulls here. Right here are all bulls. These are all heifers from Lacombe. These are their genomically enhanced breeding values for RFI and their reliability. Now, reliability isn't the same as accuracy, but if you square it, um, if you do the square root of these values here, you'll get the accuracy. So these accuracies would be around 65%. So at birth, within our own data set, right here in Alberta, we were able to generate genomically enhanced breeding values that have accuracy around 60 or 65%. So these would be just born, okay? So that's really important. So right off the bat, I'm really interested, I'm not so interested in these heifers, I'm probably interested in some of these over here, but I'm for sure interested in those bulls, um, and, and I know this when they're newly born. So that, that's the value of this. And the value of this is that from that database, as I showed you here, from this database, we generated these accuracies these accuracies on these bulls, almost what you would call at birth. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Here's another way of looking at it, maybe not so um, immediate, but here's the relationship between the sire's genomically enhanced breeding value and the average of its progeny. So use the bull, produced a bunch of progeny, went to the feedlot, how did they do? Here we see not a bad relationship, it's not as good as I would hope, but it's, it's, it's there, there is a relationship there, and it says, for each 0.1, so each tenth of a unit improvement in residual feed intake, we will increase the, in, the feed efficiency by about 0.06. And I can put that in terms of dollars. It'll be worth about $7.00 per year, $7 per head per year in feed savings. But that's only 0.1 of an estimated breeding value for RFI. What if I find a bull that's 0.5, negative 0.5? It'll be five times that value. Not six or seven dollars, but $30. One generation. What if I do this 
generation after generation after generation, and what if I not only do it on my bull side, but I do it on the heifer side, okay? The rate of genetic improvement will occur quite rapidly. So this is evidence that shows that what we think theoretically, what John Crowley thinks from a genomics point of view, is actually happening when we do it on the ground practically. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize and then we can do some questions. Really, if we select for residual feed intake, we know that we'll improve feed efficiency with not many negative effects on cow productivity, a very few, if any, negative effects on carcass traits and meat quality. We may have some small little impact on age at puberty. However, these things are manageable. I just say, look, we already, if we change the age of puberty by a little bit, we're still, that's still totally manageable and the relationship is very small. And then lastly, there, we will reduce methane emissions from our cows and we'll reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If the price of carbon goes from $10 a ton of CO2E to $30 or to $50 a ton of CO2E, then there's real money in looking at this as a way of gaining carbon credits for the agriculture industry. That would be to you. And so these are some, uh, some of the things that, uh, that we think are really important when it comes down to feed efficiency. So with that, thank you for your attention. And um, any questions, be great. So there may be a way of doing it. You might be able to test some really good bulls, bulls or other traits, and then maybe do genetic markers, low density genetic markers that won't be so costly on the female side. And then essentially cull on the basis of, cull on the female side. Here's all the females I want to keep, right? I've looked at it for other reasons. Just do a, a 6K chip, which might be John $40, 6K chip, how much does it cost? $40, okay? On the female side, and then that would only be, you might only have to keep 30 females, and then just cull the ones that just don't have a good molecular breeding value for RFI. And so that way you'd start to make it a little bit more economical. So that would be you know, 30 times $40, instead of two, 300 <laughs> times $40, right? Okay. So that may be the way you'd use it. Combining the two, males and females, is going to get you twice as much genetic progress. If you did the test on the heifers on the 6K chip, would there be any advantage to doing the cows? Yeah, do do do. So if you could, if you could afford it, want to do the heifers and the cows. Do the heifers and the cows. Yeah. And then get a bull with the 770. Well, test the bull. Test the bull. What about, if you, what about if you want to evaluate a sire that you're already ready to without, well, without going through all of... Yeah, the hoops. Yeah. Yeah, so... I mean, is there a shortcut here? Yeah, DNA. Know? Sure, DNA. So, so, do, um, so do a 50K or... A, yeah, probably do a 50K SNP chip. Right? So do a blood test. Get a DNA, a molecular breeding value generated on that app. My concern, though, is that the accuracies of those molecular breeding values to date, right now, aren't as good as they're going to be in two years. 